my name is uh, Tim Brouwer, and currently I'm writing my thesis at the Institute of Network Cultures for my Bachelor of Product Design. What I'm researching is the uh, materiality of cryptography. I'll be looking at cryptography through the lens of materials and wealth, and this will um, um, express itself in um, yeah, manners in which cryptography manifests itself in our yeah, material reality but also how cryptography can be seen as a new, new type of wealth, a new, new type of value. So as mentioned, the, the, the current rather technical and mathematical depiction of cryptography um, basically obstructs us to, to think beyond codes. And therefore, I believe that its significance and scope isn't fully comprehended. And by using product design as a, as a medium, I aim to, to reimagine cryptography. So my investigation started out with um, this cryptographic object called the Kipus, which was used in the 17th century by the Incas in South America. And so first, it, it was thought of as only a device for, for accounting and calculating. However, Spanish accounts in, in colonial times um, yeah, found out that it was also used as a way to to communicate, to, to bridge spatial, spatial distances, and basically to, to remain um, yeah, relationship, relationships with other communities. Yeah, the Incas at the time didn't have an alphabetic writing system, so they used a local syllabic writing system instead, meaning that it has both a phonetic and um, logographic, uh, using logographic symbols. And so, um, the way information was encoded in this material, into this object, was via its material, uh, material appearances. So its color, the, the fiber type, the direction of weave, the amount of knots, and also the types of knots. So yeah, this cryptographic object depicts a, a three-dimensional writing system, which can be experienced or, or sensed by using multiple senses as well as at once. So in a way, cryptography becomes a, a fiscal act or the, the fiscal act of, of encryption. So yeah, the numerous amount of configurations that were able with this, with this cryptographic object enabled it to send around 1,500 units of information, which made it a highly efficient way of communication during that time. And um, yeah, the, or to mention a quote by, by Quinn de Pont, it requires recognizing that te technology is an event. And as an event, this cryptographic object, or the kipus, um, registers reality in advance of meaning. So that being said, I argue that the kipus wasn't only a tool to, to communicate with or send letters. It was also a tool that, um, embodies identities and also cultural narratives. So it basically enabled oppression or it, it enabled um, bonding in times of oppression by, for example, the Spanish colonists during that time. And in that manner, this cryptographic object combines cryptography with identity within one portable device. Yeah, on the other hand, the kipus can also be seen as digital information, as it's either one thing or another. So as I told, a nut twisted clockwise or counterclockwise. And basically due to this discrete way of encoding information into a material, into the threads, the Kipus was capable of, it's still legible in, in this time due to this discrete way of encoding. So you can imagine, for example, a USB or a hard drive which we now use for storing information, but it's not certain if, if a USB will stand the test in time. But the cryptographic object called the Kipus did stand the test of time. A project that I was interested in was the Weaving Codes project. Yeah, the Weaving Code projects basically exemplified how information or digital information can be encoded into a fiscal object. So um, what they basically did is they, they um, they created patterns by describing the, the weaving process in code. 
and they take the code that was required to make the pattern and um, compile it into a binary form so that the digital could be translated to the, to the actual physical uh, weaving pattern. So as they beautifully described it, any woven pattern can be seen as a digital record of movement performed by the weaver. So indeed, it is the physical act of encryption. And the reason I was interested in this project is because their predominant focus lies on uh, the work from Cloud Shannon with his information theory, where he explains that information obeys to essential laws of physics. So by saying that, he uh, exemplified that um, the digital realm and intangible uh, information or code isn't as intangible and virtual as we think they are, and that they do indeed accord to yeah, physical properties in the world. Heading to contemporary cr cryptography and digital wealth, um, yeah, whether it's electronic money, tokenized assets, or identities on a blockchain, Digital wealth is gradually becoming a prominent part of our reality. And as a result, the, the importance of cryptography is increasing as well. So, um, yeah, as data became a currency, cryptography became its mediator. And in the case of Bitcoin, um, miners verify the transactions that are made on, with Bitcoins. And a, mining, uh, a miner is basically a, a computer that that runs an algorithm over and over again until it guesses a password or the, or the, um, the key to a transaction. And the chance that you can break the code is something that you can actually calculate as the code is within a predetermined range. So the interesting thing here is that um, by increasing the length of the code, you can increase the amount of time it will take to break the code. And this is also known as scarcity by design or designed governance. And so whereas with a material like, for example, gold, um, the scarcity of the material causes the value to rise. In the case of Bitcoin, it, it is the cryptographic protocol behind it that causes the value to, to increase. So cryptographic protocols as ones and zeros on a computer screen are depicting Bitcoin in an encrypted manner. However, you still, of course, need, need materials, um, hardware, and computational resources like electricity for those, yeah, for those computers and cryptographic technologies to work. And in this respect, electricity and computational resources are being turned into a yeah, cryptographic token. So in my research, I'm interested in this like intangible thing called value. So how can, for example, digits on a computer screen store value? And more importantly, in regards to cryptography, um, which processes in the, in the creation of value are being delegated to these cryptographic technologies? And with the word delegation, I basically touch upon the work of Bruno Latour with his actor network approach. And so if this is the case, how can I materialize this eventually? So perhaps the origins of money can tell us something about the fiscal requirements of, of, of value and eventually how you can reimagine cryptography and the value of cryptography. In the 17th century, uh, New England communities used clamps as a sort of money because this was the most yeah, applicable money that they could find in their, or applicable object that they could find in their environment. While a minority of the, of the community, the hunter-gatherer communities, used or uh, were capable of collecting these objects and eventually turning them into uh, necklaces as well as a sort of display of wealth, other hunter-gatherer communities used them for, um, yeah, for their medium of exchange. And later on, the uh, colonists also began to use it as a medium of exchange, as they, yeah, they, they, they saw that this type of object uh, contained value. However, later on, in regards to the colonists, the British started shipping more coins around the world. Quickly, the, the value of collectibles, as they were called, decreased as 
Metacoins had better monetary qualities, which I will elaborate on later on. So Nick Sabo coined the term collectibles to indicate these scarce objects like beads, shells, or, or feathers. They were used as a, as a sort of proto-money by many hunter-gatherer communities. And um, these objects, or collectibles, called store, transfer, and display wealth. And basically, like normal money, acted as claims on, on, yeah, on goods and, and services, for example. So in his paper, Shelling Out, Zabo describes the requirements that an artifact needs in order to be considered as a collectible. And by purely examining these material requirements, um, I aim to gain an explanation on how a material can yeah, basically en embody trust, but also value. And later on, it will become clear how this eventually re uh, will relate to cryptography as well. So yeah, the four requirements are, first of all, condensation. A collectible had multiple, multiple functions combined. So um, yeah, and this was done to, to increase its mobility and also its uh, um, usefulness, of course. So the object could, for example, condense the functions of decoration with functional properties, uh, politics with economies, or um, as, I, as I said, between stores and displays of wealth. The second one is authority resemblance. And collectibles often borrowed um, yeah, authority from what they were resembling by fiscal, or what they did were replacing by fiscal resemblance. So that was also the reason why the earliest metal coins um, had an, as you can see, a hole in the center as they were replacing the, the collectibles that used to be worn as a necklace. So the third one is unfortunate costliness. The collectible is either too difficult to find or to reproduce uh, without yeah, essentially losing its, its benefits. And likewise, the collectible is hard to copy, steal, and difficult to lose. And therefore, many collectibles were uh, indeed wearable so that they were easier to secure. And this, of course, also applies to cryptographic keys that you don't want to or rather, you want to keep them close to you in order to protect them. And it likewise applies to cryptographic protocols in general, as cryptographic protocols um, tend to work like, or yeah, they're, they're easy to verify, but difficult to reproduce or, or to, to hack, for example. And the last, the last requirement for the collectible is that the value can be estimated easily either by observing it or by measuring it. So as I said, like the cryptographic quipus, um, the, the length and the, and the shape of the, of the shell necklaces could be measured by using your senses. And um, basically by using your body as a ruler to, me to measure the value. And so as mentioned, the general requirements of collectibles indeed have a lot in common with the requirements for cryptography, especially in the novel field of fiscal cryptography, which basically uses um, randomly structured entities as, uh, as a way to secure uh, cryptography. So simply said, it is using fiscal objects as inputs and outputs for crypto cryptographic schemes. So instead of like the regular content or the regular cryptograph cryptographic technologies um, that are using mathematical properties, which on the, un on the one hand tend to be secure, but are actually based on unproven assumptions. Um, yeah, because these um, formulas aren't proven to be uh, safe. And that is also a reason why many people fear about a attack by quantum cryptography, as this might be able to hack in every account and at the end just steal your private data. So with the rise of interconnected and high-speed mobile devices, security is suffer suffering and 
the protection of your data becomes a problem, basically. So just by turning your device off doesn't prevent the, the adversary or the hacker to, to enter your private data. And the manner in which our material reality can be applied to, to secure a cryptographic scheme is, for example, just by yeah, using fiscal cryptography, which uh, stems from the fiscal unclonability and the level of entropy. So fiscal unclonability is the notion that an object needs to be one of a kind and cannot be reproduced by the adversary, even if he's, he is well equipped. And so this can be achieved, for example, by um, um, yeah, objects derived from nature or objects that are manufactured in a small scale, which inevitably contain slight variations, which makes each object unique. So instead of security through obscurity, um, even if the adversary knows the measurements of the object, he or she is still unable to, to reproduce the object. And the second thing is entropy, which is the potential for some data to be unexpected or surprising. And so this pseudo-randomness can be uh, measured by this, yeah, by this uh, entity called entropy. Uh, physical objects can easily and inexpensively produce this, this kind of entropy. Yeah, you can, for example, imagine the, the high information content or entropy that the quipus uh, contained, as there were so many ways to, to translate these um, codes into the material. And another example is um, the organization Cloudflare, who uses lava lamps as a way to, to generate strong passwords. So what they basically did is they, um, yeah, this is their setup, and they filmed the, the lava lamps and the amount of dots every lava lamp contained. Um, up next, they will compute the amount of dots, turn it into code, and use that code, which, is, uh, which has a high level of entropy, to, to create a safe password. Yeah, by using physical objects, secret keys can be derived from or hidden in the analog properties of the unique objects. And likewise, a combination of yeah, digital cryptographic systems and physical objects can be used. Um, two well-known examples are a banknote or um, a passport that uses um, digital signatures with unique physical objects so that the, yeah, the, the machine can identify the, um, the, the machine-readable features of the object and the human being can empirically examine the, the material properties like its, its weight or the, or the smell or the, or the watermark that is inside the, the paper note. On the other hand, the cryptographic technologies of electronic money are virtually rendered invisible. So to conclude, by combining the characteristics of cryptography and collectibles, um, the value of its materiality will become visible. And these cryptographic collectibles, as I would like to call them, will serve as a mediator standing in between, yeah, first of all, the, the plain text and the cipher text, but they can also stand in between um, identity and anonymity, or the virtual and the corporeal. And so, Likewise, this, this correlation um, can be used as a way to, to describe the, the agency of cryptography. So how does cryptography uh, shape our economy and our, and our society as well? So for example, the, the designed governance. And so to end this presentation with a quote from uh, Friedrich Kittler, um, who said that codes are the language of our time. And therefore, I argue that by using, for example, in my case, product design as a medium, or um, in the case of crypto design, turning abstract data into visualizations, uh, we will be able to critically reflect upon these emerging and, 
and abstract technologies. And eventually, this will help us to, yeah, to think beyond codes. Thank you.